we're talking about the uh, invasion of Normandy, Stephen Ambrose, of historical tours. Uh, we're going to specifically be talking about Omaha Beach and the Beerville Draw. Now, this is a uh, battlefield that is very popular on the Stephen Ambrose tours. It's something we visit with most of our European tours, uh, including my tour that I'll be giving uh, on June 12th, uh, the footsteps of Patton. Even though we're going to be following Patton and he did not take part in the invasion of Normandy, we will be spending two days in the area simply because it's such an important part of the entire war in Europe. If you don't follow what happened at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, you can't really get an understanding of what takes place afterwards. So, uh, you know, the, the general invasion plan of Europe in June of 1944 for the Allies is to attack in Normandy. Um, so we're looking at the invasion beaches right here from, uh, from left to right. It's Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. Uh, we're going to focus in, let's see, we're going to focus in on Omaha Beach right here. Now, this is Omaha Beach. Um, as you can see, this battlefield is about four miles long. Um, and the key to this battlefield, if the Allies are able to move up these bluffs uh, beyond the beach and move inland, uh, in how many miles, four or five miles, the invasion is a failure. What they have to do is capture the roads leading off the beach. Uh, modern armies uh, require tanks, artillery, armored vehicles, supply trucks, everything it takes to move a modern army forward, and they can't make it up these bluffs. The roads are the key. Now, of these four roads, the real key is right here. This is the Vierville Draw. Why? Because it's the only paved road off of Omaha Beach. Uh, Carrie, do you need me to start over? Oh, we're good. I'm going to say, I'm going to assume we're good. So uh, the Vierville draw is the key to, to Omaha Beach because it is the only paved road. And if we focus in on it, you can see that not only is it important to the Allies with this paved road, but the Germans understand its importance also. So what they've done is they've established three what are called Wiederstands nests. These are sort of um, uh, dugouts, uh, uh, sort of centers of gravity of defense uh, where they've set up mortars, machine gun posts, snipers nests. And then down on the beach, they have several pillboxes. Uh, one here in the center is actually going to house an 88 millimeter cannon. Uh, this one over here to the right is going to house a 72 millimeter French cannon. Uh, and these cannons are not designed or even set up to fire down the length of the beach. I'm sorry, out to sea. They're designed to fire down the length of the beach. So if there are invasion forces coming up along the beach, they're not going to miss, put it that way. So uh, to add to defenses, they also have an obstacle belt. There's a seawall that uh, has barbed wire on the top. Uh, the allies are going to have to land at low tide uh, in order to get through these obstacles. If they go at high tide, it'll destroy most of their landing craft. So we're going to go over to the next slide. So this is an aerial photograph of Beardville Draw in 1943. The Germans are building the defenses. They are not complete. This house down here is actually a bunker. Uh, it is later turned into a memorial to the 29th Infantry Division, or all the forces, the National Guard forces that fought here. Um, and the Germany. See, um, here's the bend in the road, the, the paved road. And now the Germans, with all these defenses, one of the wisest things they do, you can see these two sort of gray blocks. These are concrete walls. I believe they redid them so they were closer together, uh, one after the other. They're both about 10 feet tall. And this is all they need to block the road. If you've seen the movie The Longest Day, the wall with a giant apron, it's actually just this simple wall over the road. There is a plaque there today talking about the destruction of this wall that is so key to the invasion. So if we look at uh, some of the German defenses, so this is a gr real ground view. Uh, this is that National Guard Memorial where this white fence is, is where the 88 is firing down the beach. On top here is one of the Wiederstand's nests, you can only see it, but you can actually see uh, windows or openings in the side of the cliff uh, which were observation points for the Germans. And I believe it's on this structure right here on this far dark wall 
that has the plaque talking about the, the concrete wall that was once there. So between the Americans and the seawall, there is going to be an oblong triangular uh, pile of rocks. And uh, that's going to be someplace where they're going to stop and sort of regroup, but the G Germans have it all zeroed in. Uh, this is the view from that 88. You can see it's looking down the beach. Uh, back when it was sticking out, it's now been kind of pushed back within its uh, uh, pillbox. Uh, more of the defenses looking down the beach that still exist today. These are machine gun posts. And there it is today. You can still see the two portals. Uh, and if you go further down the beach, so this is Dog Green Beach, Beerville Draw. That's the designation of this beach right here. If you go a little bit further to the uh, to the west, that's called Charlie Beach. Uh, the 29th Division, uh, the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 29th is going to be landing here. Rangers are going to be landing down on Charlie Beach. And they're going to be coming up against this seawall with the intent on moving over to the Veerville Draw. And you can see one of the pillboxes right here looking down the beach. And on top is a big stone building that's going to house more artillery. Uh, there's the pillbox, and there's the house at the top that you can see. And this is a view from that pillbox. You can see they have a perfect vantage point looking down the length of the beach to tear anything up coming up the beach. This photograph, by the way, is taken at high tide. Uh, at low tide, you can add, pretty much add an extra 500 yards of sand uh, to the German view. So these are some of the obstacles the Germans have set up. Telephone poles with mines on top of them uh, so that the any allied landing map would ride up on them and hit those um, landmines. We got a close-up of one simple telephone pole with a mine on it. Uh, Rommel knew that if the American troops uh, landed at low tide, um, well, he wanted them to land at low tide. If they landed at high tide, they'd have a much better chance of breaching the walls. But if he could do, get them to land at low tide, he would have much better fields of fire. Hence, that's why you have all these uh, defensive uh, obstacles. So let's talk about the American invasion. Um, it's going to start with a B-24 raid at midnight. In fact, the first casualties of D-Day are a crew of a B-24 that took off from England and crashed not far from its runway. Um, the general plan for the invasion at Vierville Draw is for infantry and amphibious tanks to land simultaneously. And here's an amphibious tank. You can see it's got a canvas apron around it that's been lowered. But um, at the time, they would have been raised and enabled the tanks to swim ashore. Um, the infantry and the tanks would then be followed by engineers uh, who would have um, explosives and bulldozers. Uh, and their job was to start clearing obstacles Behind them would be artillery units to set up on the beach or further inland uh, to give supporting fire to those troops. Um, this whole plan, this well-organized plan, is going to break down almost in minutes. A lot of these amphibious tanks are going to sink uh, upon entering the water. Uh, they are supported by other tanks that are delivered by uh, landing craft tanks and landing ship tanks. And a few of those will get ashore. Um, most of the troops are going to land by LCVPs, also known as Higgins boats. But the initial landings are going to be done by soldiers in LCAs. These are British landing craft. And you can see the ramp at the front of this ship that's going to drop and all the men can rush off. Um, with the LCAs, it's actually two armored doors in the front that you open and the men have to squeeze one at a time. Um, but the plan is to land four infantry companies abreast uh, from Veerville draw all the way over to the next draw, and that way they could support each other and disperse the German fire. That's going to fall apart too. Companies G, E, and F, which are to be to the right of the assaulting company, Captain Feller's uh, A Company, um, they are going to be scattered and land too far distance beca distant because of all of the storms that have churned up the channel, the heavy winds, and the fires on the shoreline, which confuse a lot of the coxswains that are landing these ships. So the initial assault uh, by Company A under Captain uh, Taylor Fellers is going to land exactly at 6.30 a.m. Uh, even though there are some mortars landing in the water and some light machine gun fire, 
uh, his company does get ashore, makes it through those metal doors, they get up on the beach, they lay down, and the only witness is the coxswain of their craft, uh, and he says as he turned the ship around, or the landing craft around, all hell basically broke loose, and uh, German fire just poured onto the beach. One lieutenant uh, called to advance the wire cutters was cut in half. Uh, Captain Fellers was killed almost immediately, and about 22 uh, soldiers from a small town in Bedford, Virginia, are going to be killed all within about 10 minutes of each other. Um, following Company A is going to be Companies B and D, which are expecting the beach to be cleared, um, but as they get closer, they see dark things in the water. They can't figure out what they are, and it's not until they reach the beach that they realize that Company A has been basically slaughtered. Um, one of the soldiers, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to him in a second. Um, here are the landing craft kind of going ashore, the men discharging from the boats. I should mention here the German MG42 machine gun fires 20 rounds per second, and an average landing craft carries 35 soldiers. So when that ramp drops, if the Germans can train their machine guns on the ramp before it goes down, all they have to do is hold that trigger for two seconds and they've wiped out everybody in that landing craft. Um, it's pretty much a slaughter for Company A, which I mentioned. This is Captain Taylor Fellers. He actually was in the hospital and pulled himself out in order to be part of this invasion. Um, the next photos I'm going to show you are Frank Kappa photos. They are about four miles down the other end of the beach, but they give you an idea of what it was like for those soldiers coming ashore. Um, the B Company soldiers, a lot of them would take the dead bodies, Company A men, and hold them in front of them as they pushed through the water. Um, they would hide behind obstacles uh, before they moved in. Um, and basically, companies B and D, each of these companies, by the way, are anywhere from 100, 150 men each. Three companies are basically wiped out between 6.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. So that's an average of 450 soldiers uh, at the Deerville Draw, the American soldiers. Um, those that survive are going to work their way up the beach. Um, and this gives you an idea of what it was like. Two amphibious tanks did make it ashore, but they had nowhere to go because the road, the main road off the Deerville Draw was blocked. So all they could do is retreat to the waterline, move back and forth. Uh, meanwhile, the tide is starting to come in, so men are pulling the wounded forward. Uh, there's no way back. The men on the landing craft have orders not to take any wounded with them when they leave. Uh, soldiers have to resort to throwing wounded into the landing craft and saying, you know, it's your problem now. Um, on the beach, this is the shingle I had mentioned about the rocks. It's actually a very unforgiving surface. So you've got men carrying anywhere from 35 to 50 pounds of equipment on their back, wading through shoulder to waist deep water, trying to get ashore. Um, Dr. Russell Widely, a very respected professor at Temple University, said that an amphibious assault by its very nature uh, is a frontal assault. There's no tricking the enemy. They're going to see you coming, and you just have to push forward. And there's a delicate balance of equipment you have to give assaulting soldiers so that they can maneuver but resupply themselves. And those rules were very much lost on the American troops coming ashore at Omaha Beach. Uh, they were overburdened with equipment. Uh, even stuff that wasn't assigned to them, they tended to add an extra uh, ammo clip here or there, help themselves out, and ended up doing nothing but weighing themselves down. One of the soldiers who lands with Company B is uh, Bob, I'm sorry, I was going to say Bob Slaughter, that's not it. It's Harold Baumgartner. Um, he's a private. He's going to come ashore uh, pretty much to the right of the, the Beerville draw. Um, his rifle gets shot. He's going to eventually get shot about five times, but he does see a German helmet uh, pop up, and he takes a shot at it with his M1, and then when he went to recock it, the rifle breaks in half in his hands. Uh, he didn't realize he had a bullet hole through it. Uh, a soldier with a missing jaw actually went and picked up the two pieces and gave it back to him, saying, you know, please keep fighting for us who can't fight. Um, he, he's going to make it through D-Day, but that's it for his fighting days. He's going to get shrapnel in the side, uh, get shot in the foot, uh, take a number of injuries, and spend basically the rest of the war in hospitals recovering. Um, Sergeant Slaughter is actually uh, another soldier with Company B. He's going to set up 
a machine gun across from the Deerville draw and bring that 88 under fire until the machine gun jams. So uh, we basically have a stalled situation here at Deerville draw. Um, the Germans looking down from the east, uh, a place called Point de la Presse, uh, report back to headquarters around 8 a.m. They say the invasion has stopped. Uh, the engineers are no longer trying to blow up obstacles. The uh, infantry is not moving forward. We see at least 20 burning tanks and other vehicles on the beach. But there was a caveat to this victory uh, message. It said we're also not hearing from several of our command posts down on the beach. And this is a hint that things are starting to turn around for the Americans. Um, before they do, Omar Bradley is actually going to close Deerville Draw. Uh, a lot of history books have it wrong. If he closed Omaha Beach, he did not. It was only the Vereville draw that he ordered closed and wanted troops to start moving into different parts of Omaha Beach because the German fire was just too intense here. Um, simultaneous to his order, um, C Company of the 116th is going to start coming ashore. And when they realize what's happened, they're going to maneuver to the left and start landing over here you can see these little lines. Um, these are, are breakwaters. And the troops are actually going to land in these breakwaters. And it's actually going to give them protection from the machine gun fire and everything else that's coming left and right from them. Uh, right on their heels is an entire 5th Ranger Battalion. Uh, their job had been to go to Point to Hawk if signaled to come in. But they didn't receive the signal. Oh, I need to back up for a second. The second Rangers that came in the same time as A, there's about 60 of these Rangers. Uh, by the time they reach the cliff, there's only 30 of them. Uh, uh, Captain Ralph Gorenson is the company commander, and he has to make a decision. He realizes he can't go through Beerville Draw. It's blocked. So uh, what he decides to do is to scale the cliff. And if you've ever seen the movie uh, Longest Day, you know, the rangers have those uh, catapults that they fire up over the cliff at Point to Hawk. Well, Gorenson and his men don't have anything like that. What they're going to have to do is take out their bayonets and their daggers and basically drill holes in the side of the cliff and climb up using hand holds to the men behind them. And that's how they're going to scale the cliff in front of them at Charlie Beach. Once they get to the top, um, Gorenson has a decision to make. He can either turn to his right and try to make it to point to Hawk or turn to his left and try to clear out the Deerville draw area. Uh, fortunately, he makes the correct choice of turning left and begins clearing off this um, the, the, the right-hand side of Beerville Draw, that's going to save a lot of lives of 29th guys down on the beach and trying to move inland. Um, now, getting back to the 5th Ranger Battalion that lands, I would say, about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, this is an entire battalion joining Company C. And as they come ashore, uh, another landing craft comes with only a handful of men on board. And those two are going to be... So there's the landing craft coming in. You can see the hills uh, between uh, the, the, the draws right there. Uh, so Norm Coda, the assistant division commander for the 29th, is going to be on board. And Lieutenant Colonel Canham, who is the regimental commander. Uh, these two leaders are really going to make a difference. Um, Norm Coda is going to go around sort of tapping the 29th guys on the butt and saying, come on, 29, let's go. Uh, and he will also work his way over to the Rangers and their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Schneider. Uh, and he says, listen, you know, the Rangers have to lead the way. We need you guys to be the leaders. And that's exactly what happened. The Rangers blow five holes in the barbed wire. Uh, the troops of Company C blew, blew one. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Canham here, uh, he sees a soldier trying to, with wire cutters, trying to cut a hole to make room for the Bangalore torpedo that's going to blow a hole in the wire. And what he does, uh, he sees the soldier get shot. So he takes the soldier's place and gets shot in the arm, but completes the job, uh, allowing the Company C soldiers to blow a hole in the barbed wire. Norm Cota himself is going to be the first one through the barbed wire uh, in the Company C area, uh, being the leader. And these two guys are going to lead the troops, both the 5th Rangers and Company C, up these cliffs. Uh, and start working their way towards the town of Vereville. Let's see, we have a map of that. So the Rangers are actually going to try to push south. This map's a little upside down. 
uh, they're going to push south. They're, remember, their objective is to try to get to Point to Hawk to relieve the troops there. Meanwhile, Company C is going to start heading into Colville. On the way, they're going to encounter two German snipers uh, that not, kill 15 of their soldiers before some sergeants realize what's happening and order their men to fire at all the trees, and the two Germans fall out of those trees. Uh, meanwhile, the rangers are going to meet some resistance down here. Uh, Colonel Canham is going to come across them, and he orders them to pull back and defend the road. He realizes it's more important to capture Beerville Draw than to meet up with the rangers. Um, meanwhile, Company C moves into the town, and who's the first person they encounter? But Norm Coda. And he's spinning a pistol on his finger, saying, hey, what took you guys so long? Uh, very brave, very uh, casual leadership, uh, but very inspiring to the men. So Coda is going to lead the rest of the men basically down Vierville Draw the opposite way that they came. Now the Navy's going to see these troops coming down this way, and they're going to think it's Americans surrendering, so they start shelling the area. Uh, Coda and his men take cover. Um, a lot of Germans start coming out of Wiedersand's nest, surrendering. Remember I told you on the side of that cliff with some uh, open portals, uh, Coda sees some Germans there, points his pistol at them. They come out, about five of them come out. He orders a soldier to keep an eye on that portal. They eventually collect, I think it's 50 Germans. Um, so Coda's going to lead them down here uh, to the front of Beerville Draw. And when they get to those double walls and he orders the Germans through, they start panicking and freaking out because uh, they know that it's a mined area. Uh, Coda doesn't care. He steps back and waves his arm forward and says, you know, you guys go right ahead. This is your area. Um, as you mentioned, the, the naval bombardment uh, I had mentioned, uh, back then, Beerville had a church, and it was a, a sort of a perfect uh, uh, landmark uh, for the invasion fleet. And so that's one of the, the things that the troops had to look for when they were doing the invasion. So this is the actual naval shelling of the area. You can see one of the ships here firing on the beach. Now, the, the, when they brought this area under fire, remember that stone house on top of that hill I showed you? Well, they knock out two German artillery guns, and unfortunately, they roll down... Uh, to the base of the cliff where a number of wounded soldiers have gathered, and it kills them. Um, a, an officer on the beach orders his signalman to send a signal to the ships to stop firing on them. Uh, they put together two semaphore flags and basically signal to the Navy to stop firing. So um, that ends the naval bombardment. Uh, but with Vierville Draw now clear, uh, Coda having led the Germans and then his troops through it, the last obstacle is to blow that uh, double wall. So Coda starts going back down to the beach where it all started. Uh, he sees a number of bulldozers along the beach, and he starts ordering men. He says, you know, can you drive a bulldozer? And one would say yes. He's like, well, get over there. And these bulldozers had a canopy on top where they kept boxes and boxes of TNT. Um, so the engineers, what they did with the wall is they built a small wooden platform at the base uh, because they didn't want the explosion to go down. They wanted it to go up and, you know, into the wall. Um, then they started stacking the boxes. They basically make a U-shape uh, with these boxes and then take out a firing pin and, and pull the trigger. They, you know, yell back blast area clear and basically blow up both walls. They were very concerned that the explosion wouldn't work, that there was metal rebar in those walls. There was not. Um, you can see they put up a sign, D1 for dog one exit right here. Um, and this occurs around 4.30, 4 o'clock uh, after about nine hours of fighting. So it's after you know 4 o'clock that the beach is clear. Vehicles can start moving up and out um, and move inland to France. Uh, so this is sort of like, this is why this is such a key component. Uh, you can sort of see the remnants. This photo was taken a few days after the invasion. You can see the, the debris uh, from the heavy fighting and the German resistance. So that is basically the story of Beerville Draw. Like I said, it's one of the most popular uh, spots we visit in Normandy during both the Patton Tour and the D-Day to the Rhine Tour and even the Band of Brothers Tour. Uh, I encourage everybody who can hear my voice to come on our tours and experience this. I'll be leaving June 12th for the Patton Tour. Uh, we'll be visiting this area. 
and then visiting all of Patton's battlefields from Normandy all the way into Germany. We'll see his car accident site. So uh, with that, I'm going to take a look at the chat line and see if we have any questions. I'm happy to answer anything I can. Um, uh, Henry Herzog wants me to send him maps and photos. There, I'll give it my best shot. Um, some people have asked me about the casualties at Beerville Draw. It's very hard to get uh, a handle on that. Um, and it, the, the 29th Division lost about 1,000 troops in, uh, at Omaha Beach. The Rangers, a uh, uh, proportionate amount. So I would say roughly at Beerville Draw, you have anywhere from 500 to 600 uh, dead Americans laying on that beach by the end of the day. Okay, let's see what we got. Why was the 29th given the assignment versus the 1st Division? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the 29th had been the first infantry division to arrive in England and had been training since day one. Uh, the 1st Division, when they reached England, they were actually very impressed with a lot of the training techniques uh, and the abilities of the 29th. I don't think the leaders from Norm Cody, and I would say that the General Giroux, the Corps Commander, all the way up to Bradley, I don't think they thought one end of the beach was going to be harder than the other. I thought they figured they were all going to be equally difficult. And the 29th was technically under the 1st Division on D-Day uh, because the whole division did not land. So technically they were under the 1st Infantry Division, but I just don't think, despite the importance of the draw, I just don't think they realized how heavily it was defended. Uh, Colville is going to take an equal amount of casualties, the main draw where the 1st Infantry Division comes ashore. Um, early pictures showed from Beerville were they taken by the Germans. That aerial photograph from 1943, uh, was taken by an RAF fighter plane, a reconnaissance plane. All the other photographs were taken after the battle, including that one looking down the barrel of the, the gun. Um, why wasn't more smoke screening used to shield the incoming invasion force? Actually, there was a lot of smoke screening, but it was unintentional. Uh, the, the Eisenhower, when he put together his proposals of what he really wanted, was the, 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 the winds to be blowing south to keep the smoke off the Americans. Uh, the smoke actually caused a great deal of confusion to the Americans. That's why a lot of uh, landing craft landed in the wrong place. Uh, and several of the rangers, when they were working their way up the bluff, the grass was all on fire. That was the smoke screen. The gra grass is catching on fire uh, from the bombardment. And he had to put a gas mask on to make it through the, uh, the smoky area. The pillbox that was just to the right of the Verville draw was... That was able to fire down the beach, seemed to be positioned in such a way that it must have been responsible for a lot of casualties. Yes. And four miles down the beach, um, there was another 88. So between the two of them, they were covering a great deal of beach. The Germans had perfect cross cover in that area. And not in that area, but the, four, the entire four mile length of the beach. And uh, I've read a number of stories of soldiers witnessing other soldiers getting hit by an 88. They say they basically disappeared. I read somewhere that the pillbox was taken out by Ranger Julius Pepper with phosphorus grenades. Is that correct? Possibly the one higher up, but the one with the 88 seems to have been taken out by the U.S. Navy. Uh, there was an analysis done by a friend of mine named Steve Zaloga uh, using lasers. They actually, there's a, a break in the concrete in the entrance, and they were able to trace it out and uh, realized it was a naval shell that knocked out that 88. Um, why was the intense naval bombardment pre-invasion unable to take out the Beerville Draw defenses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the, the number one answer would be camouflage and poor visibility. Uh, the, a storm had really churned up the channel, and um, the Germans were very good at camouflaging their, their defenses to make them look like houses and things like that. Uh, the Allies uh, had invaded North Africa and Sicily and um, didn't seem to learn the lessons from one invasion to the next. I guess they did in Sicily, uh, but it, it was sort of like they were relearning the whole thing in Normandy. Uh, even though they had the first infantry there, it had a great deal of replacements. Um, Omar Bradley had been part of the uh, invasion of Sicily, but had not been the, the key player, as was General Patton. Uh, Patton, I should mention, you know, led the invasion of North Africa, the invasion of Sicily, and then three amphibious landings on the northern coast of Sicily. It was almost like he was preparing the troops for future amphibious landings. And by the time of D-Day, he's the most experienced amphibious commander we have, and he's put aside. Um, do you know where Harold Baumgartner was from? 
Uh, I did at one point. I want to say Virginia. Um, he is part of that unit. Or was he from New York? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I have that information. Um, I have it somewhere. Uh, I'm kind of looking at my notes here to see if I had mentioned where he was from, but I just don't have it here. Um, Kim Baker is typing right now. Uh, I met, I, I've talked to Harold, I, I talked to him a number of times on the phone, a very gracious man. There's a pier that juts out uh, from, from the, the, the beach, a uh, fishing pier. Uh, and Mr. Baumgartner, or Dr. Baumgartner, said that's where he came ashore, was right by that pier. Was anyone in the Air Force held responsible for changing the bombing time on target? Someone changed the release time and the bombs fell inland. That was actually Air Force policy. Um, the Air Force usually, uh, they have medium bombers for tactical missions and four engine bombers for strategic missions. A tactical mission is there's a German tank in front of us. We need someone to take it out. Strategic is knock out that city. Uh, but here they're using strategic bombers in a tactical mission. And um, I think in Ambrose's D-Day book, he says that one of the guys doing the, dropping the bombs th thought his brother was down there and didn't want him to land on him. That wasn't true. Uh, Air Force policy or Army Air Force's policy at the time was if you're bombing through clouds, you have to wait an extra you know, five or ten seconds before releasing so that you don't drop on anything you don't want to. And so the Air Force was simply following Air Force policy in that, uh, in that situation. Um, we used strategic bombers in a tactical way, again, in Co Operation Cobra, about two months later. It's a disaster. Um, but no, to my knowledge, nobody was held accountable in the Air Force. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Rick. Rick, you should come on my tour. Uh, i got to get back to work. <laughs> okay. Uh, David, uh, let's see. Ex explanation as to, whoop, sorry, they're kind of moving faster. Why so many of those guns survived the air bombardment? Um, the air bombardment, it, a lot of it did go inland. Com well, the, the air bombardment completely missed is a simple answer. I've uh, read a number of eyewitness accounts by civilians. They say the bombs hit the cliffs. Uh, a lot of them blew up along the cliffs, but none of them hit any of the ground target. They, they're, they're bombing blind. Uh, they're, their best bet would have been to, you know, use a more sustained naval bombardment. Uh, but the more sustained naval bombardment, the more time you have to give the enemy to react and you lose the element of surprise. It's not like the islands of the Pacific. Um, hi, Kevin. We looked it up here. <laughs> okay, Bombard was from the Bronx. Okay, so he was from New York. Um, Fred Hawkins, thanks me for the presentation. Thank you, Fred. Fred, Fred Williams enjoyed the presentation. Let's do this again. I completely agree. Um, okay. Uh, if there's no more questions, wait a second. I got one more coming through. Oh, okay. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Um, so anyways, that is your summation of the Battle of Deerville draw. Uh, you know, if anybody has any other questions, uh, please contact me through Ambrose Tours. I'm happy to give out my email right now. It's kevin dot h-y-m-e-l at gmail dot com. Very simple. And I'd love to hear from any and all of you. So uh, have a great day. With that, I'm going to end the event. Um, just check if there's any more questions. Um, Oh, wow. Someone, Kim, Kim Baker's been on a lot of our tours. Make it one more. Okay, guys. I hope everybody has a great day. Let me just, um, and does anybody have any questions about the tours themselves? Uh, like I said, my tour is going to be leaving soon. Um, and uh, what we've got D Day to the Rhine tours, Band of Brothers tours, a lot of them visit, uh, you know, a number of those places. Oh, someone just repeated that how Baumgartner was born in the Bronx, and that is in New York. Um, and, uh, you know, we just look forward to having you guys on any of our tours. I would, you know, encourage you to go on all of mine, but, uh, all of our tour guides and historians are excellent. I know them all. I consider them all friends. Uh, we compare notes all the time. So any Ambrose tour you go on will be excellent. And I guarantee you, you'll have a great time. So with that, I'm going to sign out and hope you all have a great day. Take care.